I would like, if I may, to take you on a strange journey. Well, strange journeys, really, but I couldn't resist opening this all with a Rocky Horror quote. What do I mean when I say ergodic? I'm hoping these videos can plumb the depths of ergodic literature and experience. But before I can jump into the deep end of media analysis, we need to wade into the kiddie pool and center on some definitions. And before we can even do that, I should probably tell you who I am. Hi, I'm John. For more than a decade, I was one of a team of four people helping guide best practices and training for public communication, storytelling, and visitor experience in one of the largest names in the field here in the United States. I suspect they'd not want me to name them because it might look like an endorsement, which it's not. That's an unfortunate situation, but no problem, sir. Over that decade, the main focus of our work centered on shifting visitor experience in parks and museum spaces, from passive to active. A huge source of the inspiration was the work of Nina Simon between Museum 2.0 and Participatory Museum. We structured that revolution in goals and mindset under the idea of ACE, audience-centered experience. Really, it boiled down to one major tenet, the audience should not be treated as a passive consumer here to watch you perform and instill sainted knowledge upon them. Instead, they should be treated as peers in the process of meaning-making, equal contributors who are invited to share of their own life story, interact with the place, and create social bonds with other humans using amazingly powerful spaces. So basically, I've been thinking about interactive experiences for a long time. It's why the idea of ergodic literature, and ergodicity in cultural experiences in general, has really captured my attention. Let's drill down to it. Ergodicity in fiction was first introduced by Espen Erseth in the 1990s, codified in the 1997 cybertext Perspectives on Ergodic Literature. The idea is complex, so I'm going to try to break it down to basics for you. Erseth takes his definition of cybertext from a 1940s scholar, by the way, so the term definitely isn't limited to computer-based narratives. The idea is a complex work or experience, something that contains feedback loops and interactive moments. Cybertext is just a fancy way of saying complex dynamic media. That's where Erseth layers on his ergodic element. Old-school definitions of cybertext, he argued, were about the reader consuming something passively. It did, as he said, center attention on the consumer or user of the text as a more integrated figure, but that reader was still only interacting all in his head. Erseth wanted to investigate how readers externalized their experience with a piece of media. How did they truly and actively interact with the text? During the cybertextual process, he writes, the user will have effectuated a semiotic sequence, and this selective movement is a work of physical construction that the various concepts of reading do not account for. Yeah, Erseth's writing is really dense and hard to parse. Let me paraphrase that. When experiencing a cybertext or interactive work of media, the user creates new symbolic pathways and connections through their actions. Those actions build together to make a new, unique experience for the reader, Something beyond just, quote-unquote, reading. That process is why Erseth coined the term ergodicity. This phenomenon I call ergodic, he writes, using a term appropriated from physics that derives from the Greek ergon and hodos, meaning work and path. Then comes his cherry of a definition. In ergodic literature, non-trivial effort is required to allow the reader to traverse the text. That's the line of a dense academic book that has launched a thousand geeks onto the internet. Okay, maybe not a thousand. More like a dozen. Searching YouTube for ergodic literature will yield a healthy little handful of videos, almost all of them settling on that single line as a definition of ergodic. It's enticing, I get that. On one level, it's useful. 
Also, in a book that's rife with academic jargon and stilted construction, it's tantalizingly concise. But what I love about the idea of ergodic fiction is the nuance and insight that the next 180 pages of the book's academic jargon hold. Ersif weaves a fascinating tapestry of possibility. And yes, it's nearly inscrutable if you don't inhabit the ivory tower. Luckily, I'm ivory tower adjacent. I'm not going to be able to summarize all of his analysis here. It took him a whole book, and this is a YouTube video after all. But I do want to investigate one amazing tool that I think folks who stop at one sentence really are missing. In Chapter 3, Erseth dives into typology, building classification systems and sorting things into groups, and he creates a great seven-part typology for ergodic experiences. Again, his prose is sometimes dense, so I've adapted it into my own system to analyze works. Dynamism The extent to which the content changes based on the audience's actions. Determinability the extent to which the order of content changes based on the audience's actions. Transience. The extent to which the speed or pace of the experience changes based on the audience's actions. Audience perspective. The extent to which each member of an audience is allowed or expected to be an active participant in the creation of or shaping of the narrative. Access. The extent to which an audience member can access portions of the experience at any time. Linking. The extent to which an audience member's exploration is facilitated by markers or signposts towards other sections or segments. User functions. The primary purpose of the audience in the experience. Analytical, explorative, configurative, or expressive. You can probably start to see how this framework takes that simple definition, non-trivial effort is required to allow the reader to traverse the text, and blows it up into a complex and rich tapestry of possibilities. We're really starting to describe that non-trivial effort in detail. It also starts to explain how media and experiences as diverse as books, games, YouTube videos, Twitter feeds, even theme parks or museums, can all start to fit in small corners of the ergodic definition and still make sense. This is the framework I want to play with as I look at media, the complex definition of ergodicity. I'll be asking a number of questions of each piece of media I look at. Do the contents of an experience change depending on the individual user's actions? Does the amount of content available change depending on the individual user's actions? Does the individual user choose a pathway through the experience, or is every audience member's route always the same? Does the individual user have control over the rate at which they progress through the experience? Is the individual user asked to play an active role as a character, themselves or someone else? and make decisions that impact the outcome of the experience. Does it require extra work or specific conditions to be met for an individual user to access portions of the experience? Does the experience explicitly direct the individual user to visit or explore other portions of the experience? How explicitly interconnected are the individual elements of the experience? Is the individual user asked to do more than passively consume the text? Are they asked to take an active role in finding a path through the experience? Is the individual user asked to alter the elements of the experience? Are those alterations permanent? Are they publicly visible? All of this boils down to a simple concept. I think we can begin to dissect ergodic experiences and see what makes them tick. Why are they effective, impactful, meaningful? How can we replicate the successes and learn from the stumbling? Of course, this is going to be subjective. All art criticism runs through the lens of the individual critic. There will be moments when I pan your favorite things, or when 
the thing I champion seems hackneyed to you. But at least with a tool as good as Ersith, we might be able to catch some of the glimmers of success. Dancing around that idea, and thanks to the input of a fellow creator whose work we'll talk about in a later video, I want to criticize the tool I'm going to use to form my criticism. How's that for meta? I think one of Aerith's seven elements is largely a product of its moment, transience. Since Aerith first created this framework in the 1990s, so much of our culture has become on demand. We can pause live television, rewind it, time shift it. The idea of broadcast has changed entirely. Media is now designed to be paused, replayed, reinvestigated, and scrutinized almost as a given. Anything you create, from paintings to prose, games to galleries, movies to music, will be binged, rebinged, and repeatedly consumed by your audience. You won't hear me talking all that much about whether an experience is transient or not, because the point is largely moot. See? I've already simplified the model. Now we have six dimensions. Dynamism, determinability, audience perspective, access, linking, and user function. For the first piece of ergodic media I analyze, I'm headed to the internet's go-to example. It's the one everyone on the YouTubes talks about when the term ergodic gets bandied about. But frankly, I'm not sure people have quite gotten to the core of why exactly it's ergodic. I'll be digging into a strange book about a non-existent documentary about an impossible house very soon. Stay tuned.